globally the <coughs> challenge remains i have already touched upon it europe should come out of its crisis africa should put its act together put its infrastructure you know fix its infrastructure problem and fix its political problem because that has a potential to be the growth driver for the world china also needs to take bold decisions in terms of reforms in terms of uh, reviving their financial and banking system because we do not have full information about the how their banking system is performing so china needs to follow their policy and a chinese the way the chinese economy behaves has lot of impact on india it does not impact us in the way chinese economy would impact let us say a country like uh, thailand or malaysia or taiwan or other countries which are part of the chinese value chain when i say i value chain what i mean is that the chinese manufacturers somewhere in the value chain somewhere in terms of supplying imports and raw materials or in terms of purchasing finished products you are linked to the chinese manufacturing either either in the you know either in the uh, in the back end in terms of supplying raw materials to chinese manufacturing companies or in terms of purchasing goods produced and manufactured in china in the front end part of it fortunately india is not a part of the global value chain which is built around china so since we are not a part of the global value chain of china we are to that extent as a economy as an economy india is well insulated but chinese economy also is hitting us in another manner because they have excess capacity in areas like steel in aluminium and in so many other areas so naturally there is a tendency for the chinese companies now to dump uh, you know steel aluminium at throw away prices the government has responded to it by leaving an anti dumping a safeguard duty of 20% apart from increasing the customs duty on steel the government has also levied a safeguard duty of 20% so today the duty on import of chinese steel is something like 32 plus 32.5% but even with that 32.5% duty the chinese companies are still selling it at a lower price because they have excess capacity they have excess production so that is a challenge which is uh, which is there for us and we are impacted i cannot say that we are completely insulated we are insulated to the extent that we are not a part of the chinese value chain but we are not insulated so far supply of this kind of dumping problem which is now being encountered vis-a-vis -vis the chinese uh, suppliers the other global challenge today is how the us fed that is the counterpart of our reserve bank of india how the us fed withdraws from its monetary expansion policy you would have seen in the newspapers over the last several months or in the last one or two years every now and then there are reports by experts about the us fed rates whether the usa is going to you know roll back their expansionary policy you will recall i at the beginning of my address i did mention that uh, the chinese uh, you know that uh, us undertook monetary expansion so us has pumped in lot of money into the market and uh, that is the borrowings of the us have gone up you know through issue of treasury bills through issue of various other government instruments they have borrowed and they have injected the us fed has injected lot of money into the global uh, financial system and the interest rates have been reduced but the moment but now the time has come for us because and the us did it mainly to revive the growth and us has been able to do it and sustain it because you know dollar is the international reserve currency india cannot do that another country cannot do that because rupee is not the international reserve currency or any other country you know their dollar is the international reserve currency so therefore usa is able to do that but i think since the us job figures are showing some improvement there is expectation that the united states will sooner or later perhaps in in december they will start increasing the interest rates and that will have lot of impact on volatility of the international markets but having said that let me also say i don't want to create a sense of alarm let me also say that thanks to the mechanism and the interaction today we have in the glo global platform like the g20 
and the dialogue which goes on between the central banks of each and every country we have now we meaning india and other developing countries the message has been conveyed to the us and i think us has also accepted this message that whatever policy adjustment rate adjustment they should they do they should do it in a very cautious and calibrated manner so that the international financial markets are not hit by volatility i think last time also everybody expected in october everybody expected that the usa will increase the policy rates but they did not increase the interest rates because there is realization that they want to be much clearer about the actual revival of the us economy and at the same time they also want to do it in a manner that it does not create global financial or monetary volatility even in the latest uh, pronouncement which was made by the fed uh, governor janet yellen she has also mentioned that they will do a very calibrated and cautious adjustment so therefore i think uh, uh, although the challenge remains about uh, the challenge uh, the uh, remains about uh, challenges arising out of the adjustment of policy rates but i think us will do it in a very cautious manner now having mentioned all these uh, points i'll just finish in 5 minutes having uh, talked about all these uh, issues i would like to touch upon the various reform measures which the government has undertaken and which the government is undertaking now which will make a difference so far as our economy is concerned i mentioned about uh, i mentioned about you know growth now i will just touch upon i have got several points i will very quickly run through them because i don't want to bore you further with uh, this kind of uh, this thing uh, i mean uh, i don't know whether it uh, what i'm saying whether it makes any sense but uh, i'll just quickly run through some of the points the various reform measures which are being undertaken by the government the first reform measure the first and foremost priority so far as government is concerned is early implementation of the goods and services tax early implementation of the gst india is a divided market every state is a separate market we as a country do not have a common market as a result we have a situation where you don't uh, you know the value chain is not an all india value chain the value chain you know you have islands of you know one state tamil nadu another state maharashtra so if you supply some input some automobile component you supply from chennai to a car manufacturer in maharashtra then you pay the tax here but you don't the, get the tax credit for having supplied it to maharashtra in central excise you get it because central excise is an all india tax but where it comes to sales tax what is now known as vat you don't get credit any tax credit so that adds to your cost and therefore it also results in a situation where there is tax on tax and then we have multiplicity of taxes every state has its vat number of taxes you have entertainment tax you have luxury tax you have uh, uh, additional sales tax you have i mean additional vat you have vat this multiplicity of taxes so the whole idea of gst is to have india as one market to avoid a situation where you have tax on tax and to have a simple tax structure to avoid multiplicity of taxes and have a reasonable rate so that india is one common market and that will increase that will improve the competitiveness of indian manufacturing industry experts have said that the introduction of gst will give a boost to our uh, gdp by about uh, 1 and 1/2 to 2% i am quite confident that uh, the gst will come sooner or later whether it will happen in the winter session or in the budget session that's a parliamentary issue i am not competent to talk on that and i would not like to talk on that but so far as the administrative preparedness of central and state governments are concerned both the central government and the state governments are administratively well prepared to introduce gst at the earliest the legislative the legislation the bills are ready the administrative manuals are ready the it backbone is being rolled out it will be ready the trial run will start on 1st january so administratively we are ready to introduce gst and internationally i mean our interaction with other countries also shows that all almost every big economy today whether it is usa or europe or other emerging economies they are looking at india how india is able to navigate its reforms they are very keen that gst comes in india because that will add that will give a lot of boost to indian growth and that will open up lot of opportunities for you know the for uh, companies that side to come and invest in india to manufacture in india to sort of 
supply to the Indian market. The second uh, policy reform area, the key reform area is in the area of tax administration and tax policy. With regard to, I mean GST is also relates to taxation but when I talk of tax administration I am just referring to the income tax and the direct taxation side where you would have seen that yesterday the government has announced you know removal of the exemptions. Now because you have got so many exemptions which are given under income tax you know there are plethora of exemptions and all the litigation that we have in our country relating to tax uh, relating to taxes are because of these exemptions. So the exemptions are being removed and the income tax rates also the government has said the corporate tax rates will be reduced from 30% to 25% in a gradual manner over the next three to four years. The third biggest reform agenda that the government has is to enact a bankruptcy law. In our country it's very easy to start a company but you know it's like uh, it's like the chakra view you start a company you enter the business but to exit to close down the company to go for liquidation is a horrendous task it is you know it's a long drawn process and it is very difficult it creates problems because your assets are locked up resources are locked up and a business i mean a business should be allowed to close a business should be allowed to die when it wants to die when it wants to close down so in fact in the ease of doing business analysis which the World Bank has done, the absence of a bankruptcy law is seen as a major deficiency, major minus point so far as our ease of doing business is concerned. The uh, bankruptcy uh, law, the, we had government had appointed a committee. Uh, the committee has, the Vishwanathan committee has uh, given its recommendations, submitted its report recently, I, uh, very recently they have submitted the, about three weeks ago they have submitted the report to government and that's on, you know, we are, it's our endeavor to introduce that legislation in the parliament at the earliest. The fourth challenge is to fix the problems of uh, uh, stressed assets in the banking sector. So we require a lot of banking sector reforms. In banking sector, a policy of Indra Dhanush, which mainly relates to governance and you know, improving the governance systems in the banks, especially the public sector banks, these measures have been introduced. But dealing with the stressed assets is a major challenge and that the government is now, there are you know, various options are under consideration in the government and uh, I would expect some uh, very bold uh, decisions to be taken by the government with regard to uh, the fixing the problem of the stressed assets and basically fixing the problem of you know bringing about banking sector reforms. The fifth area is to open up the you know the external commercial borrowing regime because many of our companies require a lot of external borrowings and uh, in this between finance ministry and reserve bank of India we have worked together we have worked together a series of liberalization measures. These have been put in the public domain and the comments from the public were invited. RBI has examined those comments. They have shared those comments with us. We are now discussing with RBI and I would expect before the end of the month a major uh, liberalization of uh, the ECB policy that is the policy of external commercial borrowings to be announced before the end of the month. Next point, the sixth, sixth point is uh, something which the Prime Minister had spoken about on 15th August in, uh, you know, while addressing the nation from the Red Fort, he had talked about startups. He had used this uh, phrase, startup, start stand up. You know, startup companies have a very important role to produce, to create more number of jobs. There are lots of young entrepreneurs, there are lots of young innovative minds. There are lots of graduates from engineering colleges, from you know commerce colleges, a lot of graduates you know who, who are from who are from general you know who have done arts or science courses but full of lot of innovative ideas. They are the ones who are starting new companies, new businesses, whether it's a company or it's a limited liability partnership or it's a private firm. So government today is working on based on the announcement made by the Prime Minister, we are now working on providing an enabling ecosystem, an enabling environment where it becomes easier for startup companies to access equity money because these are all youngsters full of ideas, 
but lack of resources so this should be given you know from where they will access equity from where they will get loans and the ease of doing business that is you know too much of regulations too much of controls and other things should be liberalized so startup companies the government is now emphasizing and i think the policy announcements should be made uh, quite soon the eighth uh, the seventh point is the area where we are working government is working very strongly is with regard to the infrastructure sector fixing the sectoral issues there have been problems around uh, railways there have been problems around uh, power generation the power sector there have been problems around the road sector road sector fortunately has picked up lot of constructions are going on power sector recently the government has announced a major financial uh, restructuring of the distribution electricity distribution companies this policy was announced approved by the cabinet about uh, two weeks ago and uh, so various infrastructure sectoral issues are being addressed eighth point is with regard to fdi policy now fdi policy foreign direct investment policy the process of liberalization will continue i think after 1991 when the fdi policies were liberalized the latest announcement made by the government is perhaps the single largest policy decision in fdi made in the last two and a half decades a large number of sectors you know the sectoral caps that is you for every sector you can bring in 26% equity you can bring in 74% of equity so government took the view that where we are permitting somebody to bring 26% fdi in a company let's allow him to go to 49% because both are same 26% gives you only a power to block certain special resolutions in the company but all of you who are you know who have experience in running companies or who have seen how companies work how many special resolutions come so it's just a issue of mindset so wherever 26% was allowed fdi has been allowed to in, has been allowed to go up to 49% wherever fdi was allowed up to 74% it has been made 100% and whatever is up to 49% excepting few sectors they have all been put on the automatic route they don't need to come to our department to the foreign investment promotion board that is fipb for a clearance in fact i uh, you know as secretary of the department of economic affairs i chair the fipb meetings and i found that lot of proposals which come and you go on you know in a meeting you just go on clearing them so at the end of the day you ask yourself why this proposal came to the fip in the first, first place you don't have an answer so therefore government has very rightly put as many fdis as possible on the automatic route and today almost uh, i would say that about 96 97% of our fdi will come in the automatic route just about 3 to 4% will come through the fipb route because we don't you know this is the whole uh, policy of what uh, the government has been talking about uh, uh, you know uh, minimum government and maximum governance you set the rules you set the parameters very clearly upfront in a transparent manner then don't interfere unnecessarily don't expect people to come to you every occasion for a permission or for a license now the fdi policy liberalization is a continuing exercise and i am sure it will continue one of the major liberalizations which has been done in the latest fdi policy announcement is with regard to the real estate sector now today if you go around any urban center or even any tier 2 cities you find lot of real estate projects half complete they're not able to complete because the promoters have you know they have these assets have become non performing assets or the promoters do not have the resources they're not able to complete the projects individuals who have tried to purchase a flat they have made advance payment of few installments the houses are not being flats are not being delivered money is locked bank finances are locked so you have large number of half complete projects then you have large number of completed projects where the developers and promoters want to take out their money and move on and invest in some other new project or in some other investment they are also not able to take out their money because there are no big buyers so this real estate sector opening up of the fdi in real estate sector is i i mean in my own understanding and this is the understanding we have in government it's not my personal understanding alone that this opening up is i think is going to be a very big growth driver in the months and in the years to come
because construction sector means more demand for steel more demand for uh, cement more jobs of construction workers both skilled and non skilled more demand for you know electric you know the for the supply of domestic furnishings for supply of all these electrical fittings for supply of all the sanitary fittings so this is i think going to be a very big uh, growth driver in the coming months and in the uh, coming years but at the same time we have been very careful government has been very careful to ensure because you know we have this mindset that all all real estate investment is hot money now it is not so if there is a worry that the foreign investment will come and then it will go back to safeguard against that government has put a 3 year lock in period so if you bring foreign direct investment into the real estate sector for 3 years you cannot take out your money but but there is another kind of flexibility has been given if a company from us has brought in money and after one year he wants to take out take out his money for whatever reason he can transfer it to another foreign investor in other words the shares will transfer between him between a non resident to another non resident from one foreign company to another foreign company but dollar will not flow out of india so therefore we have hedged ourselves we have protected ourselves from the risk of dollars coming in and suddenly vanishing at the same time we have facilitated lot of investment to come into the real estate sector and i think this is going to be a very big uh, game changer so far as injecting the required economic uh, boost to our economy is concerned then apart from that the ninth point i would like to highlight is with regard to ease of doing business lot of process reforms are being carried out by the government to give clearances environmental permissions the fipb clearances etc the uh, tenth point uh, i would like to mention is with regard to the huge uh, program which the government has launched the skill india mission you know which has been launched so with together with startups and the skill india mission i mentioned if you recall i mentioned about the necessity to create more jobs so i think the startup ecosystem which will facilitate large number of startup companies to come and these small companies each of these companies we are looking at a situ situation where each of these small companies will create 20 jobs 30 jobs 40 jobs now just imagine if totally we have hundreds of startup companies and each of them creating 30 40 50 jobs the kind of potential it has in terms of uh, creating more employment opportunities in our economy but we need a skilled population because we need our youngsters our youth to be skilled so that our demographic advantage continues to be a democratic demographic advantage and doesn't become a liability in the future so the skill india mission is one program which is being launched in a very strong manner and that is being taken forward now apart from that we have other programs the government has launched i will not like to go into that programs like digital india and basically you know harnessing technology into our process reforms so there are lots of lot many more reforms but i would not like to i mean i can go on and on and on but uh, these are some of the important ones which i listed out which i thought i should uh, share with an august uh, and uh, very much aware and uh, conscious audience that we have here today to conclude i would like to say that so far as reforms are concerned the reforms are a continuing process and so far as the government is concerned reforms are a 24 into 7 exercise we will not government will not for wait for a event like the budget to announce reforms fdi reforms could have been delayed till the budget but since the policy decisions were ready and let me mention that this decision was taken in great speed i mean this kind of speed in government decision making is something which is today uh, particularly noteworthy so government will not wait for a major event like the budget to announce uh, reforms government will not delay any reforms if a particular reform is ready if we have examined it and we are ready reform measures will be announced so it will be a continuous exercise reforms will be a 24 into 7 exercise so far as the government is concerned we as a country whether we are in government or we are outside i think together we should do our best and we are committed to ensure that the growth that we unleash lot of uh, forces which will eventually generate uh, growth and good life for our people 
as the economist magazine described in its uh, you know in its publication about a year ago or year and a half ago this is india's chance to fly and i think all of us indians should do our best to ensure that the country really flies thank you very much you sir you started with uh, pre liberalization and gone and extended up to minimum governance and is going about 24 for 7 sir i think we must give a good hand to mr uh, shakti gandas for an excellent address sir it's a great learning experience for everybody and uh, i spelt out about the government's vision yeah as uh, secretary is kind enough to take few questions but let it be very specific and uh, can list out to only few ones and uh, may now request uh, the participants to introduce themselves and have one or two few questions Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, my my question to you is based on the lecture that you gave on the on based on the lecture that you gave on the the fall in private investment. Uh, we do notice that private investment has uh, come down since the previous years, and while the government is at a stage of uh, phasing out uh, deductions, exemptions, and uh, uh, on the fiscal side, we notice that in is India. my question to you is is india ready for this fiscal regearing of a you know of a of a saga of no exemptions no deductions or do indian businessmen need the incentives like your atia or your athhc or your scz and all those kinds of benefits for them to invest more isn't it a dichotomy you see first thing is that the reduction in corporate tax will be gradual it's not uh, going to be overnight from 30% it's not going to be reduced to 25% it will be done over a period of 3 to 4 years that will make us competitive vis-a-vis -vis all our neighbors if you see the asean rates and rates which is prevalent in other countries the rates are about 20% 22% 23% hmm. we are 30% today if there is a first time saying from the international perspective then i'll talk about from our domestic perspective the international investor today he has a choice of investing either in malaysia or in uh, thailand or in india or in any other country one key parameter when he does his calculation is the tax you know the tax administration and the tax rates so we compare very unfavorably there so that is why the effort is to take our tax rates to 25% secondly i mean having worked in the revenue department having worked as revenue secretary i can tell you with certainty that the benefit of tax exemptions is mostly is mostly enjoyed by the big companies small and medium enterprises maybe at the beginning when the industry is being set up a new sme small and medium enterprise is being set up at that stage he gets some depreciation and he gets some tax benefits but a sme a small and medium unit is not in a position to invest year after year to get the benefit of de depreciation accelerated depreciation additional depreciation and other kinds of benefits so invariably majority almost all smes end up by paying 30% tax whereas the big companies without if the mat was not there you know if minimum alternate tax was not there they would all be paying uh, less than 10% tax so the biggest beneficiary i mean the biggest losers i mean i'm not blaming anyone for this i mean that is a policy of the government if i have a big company if government gives me a certain advantage i will enjoy it naturally i mean there's nothing wrong in it but smes are not in a position to get the benefit so if we are looking at more investments to come in in any case the big companies are paying about 18 and half percent already and 18 and half plus the surcharge etc put together is about 20 21% they are paying already so the big companies probably will move from about 20 21% to 25% and the small and medium sized companies which are today paying 30% 
plus this surcharge and all that, they will move to 25%. So therefore, overall, if you see, it will be beneficial for the economy and litigation, almost 70% of our tax litigation, the tax arbitrage, the harassment, you know, all this thing is because of the exemptions. You have an exemption, I am the, you know, I am the tax officer, so I can use my power to extract something, you know. The arbitrage and all these things come where exemptions are available. Once you remove exemptions, then I can assure you that litigations will automatically vanish. 70% of the litigation will just simply go. So I think overall it's good for our economy. And as an economy, I think, uh, uh, you know, the industry and the business should really calculate their financials not in terms of you know depending on the kind of arbitrage which government will today give some exemption withdraw it tomorrow it leads to a lot of uncertainty also so it's better to have a stability and certainty of policy where if, you know all round it will be good for the economy sir my first question is you touched about this current account deficit during, uh, during the time when rupee versus uh, dollar was at the peak of 68 rupees. In this, leaving aside the import and export deficit, the investment of the Indian companies abroad and import of gold played a vital role. Where do we stand now to control this to bring the current account deficit? You have said that crude prices are less, but the disturbing factor is the import of crude is less, that means the consumption by the industries is less, which will in turn will affect the growth of industry. You see, Secondly, my question is regarding the GST, the manufacturing state is not in an advantageous position, whereas the consuming state has got. How this is addressed into that? And the third one is make in India. See, the 30% local content was the past procedure whenever then FDI is allowed. Now it seems that it is relaxed. As the RBI governor said, it's not only make in India, make for India will be the beneficial for the economy of this country. Where do this government's policy addresses this thing? What was the first one? Uh, first one was current account deficit, you said. You see, we have benefited because of the low oil prices, low crude prices. Obviously, we have benefited out of uh, that for our current account deficit. So far as gold is concerned, the gold imports today, there's a customs duty of 10%. Notwithstanding the 10%, a lot of smuggling is taking place, but it goes to the credit of our customs department that they are, you know, they have very effectively, they are taking action. But the duty of 10% and there are some restrictions earlier, you know, this business of 80, 20, you import 100, uh, uh, let us say you import 100 grams of gold, then you have to export 20 so that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, and you have to use 80 and then you export 20, then you can import another, you know, all kinds of restrictions were there. there. That was leading to a lot of unfair practices in the market. Only some people were benefiting, so that has been removed. So gold imports are today well under control. Crude prices are low. Hopefully they will continue to be low. There are experts who say that it will remain at the current level. It will go down to 40 or even below 40 dollars. But again, crude prices are something which just cannot be predicted. So current account deficit, I think, is uh, well under control. And uh, you mentioned about gold and what else? Huh? Uh, and outward FDI. No, outward FDI is a good sign. I mean, it, uh, it's a good sign that our companies today are becoming international companies. If Tata's are going and uh, becoming one of the largest uh, job providers in, U in UK, I think it's a matter of pride uh, for our country. Next, you talked about GST, that the manufacturing states will uh, lose and the consuming states will benefit. Now, let me tell you, it's only in theory. You take a consuming states. Consuming states are basically compared to manufacturing states like Tamil Nadu or Maharashtra or Gujarat. A consuming state is not as developed. So the average purchasing power in a consuming state is much less. Whereas the average purchasing power in a manufacturing state because of our high salaries, high wages 
and because of more development. The average purchasing power in a state like Tamil Nadu or uh, Maharashtra or Gujarat is much higher than several other states which are not as developed. So in the market, you may have more buyers there, more manufacturing goods may be going from here to there, but average purchasing power is more here. So therefore, the manufacturing states, because of higher purchase arising from higher income levels, the manufacturing states will gain out of GST, I can say it with confidence. Maybe initially one or two years there will be a revenue dip because the central sales tax where you know they, are, they get about 1000, 1500 crores that goes. So maybe for one or two or three years there may be some loss. But I can tell you with confidence that from the third or fourth year onwards the manufacturing states will gain more and because of India becoming one market the competitiveness of the manufacturing states will go up the purchasing power, average purchasing power of our boys and girls who are working in many companies will go up. So therefore GST is not a one-sided thing for the benefit of the consuming states, it will benefit the manufacturing states also. And the third point was... Uh, no, no, 30% local content, you see there is a lot of misunderstanding around it. Earlier what did it say? Now from the date you bring the FDI, you have to have 30% local content. Now I am bringing my money from a foreign country today. From tomorrow how do I do 30% local sourcing? I have to set up my, you know, I have, to get a, I have to get a premises, I have to take something on rent, I have to start manufacturing, I have to start my shop, I have to build up my, you know, supply chain, distribution network. So I need a lot of preparation time. So because of this artificial, unrealistic condition, you know, this sector has not really taken off. We put restrictions, you see, we expect people to go into the football field and play. But we tie their hand, we tie their leg, we tie them, and you know, how, how does he run? He is not able to run, how can he play football, please? So therefore, this condition was totally impractical and because of this condition, nothing was happening. Now what the government has said, that it will be 30% from the date of starting of business from the date of commercial operation in other words the gestation period the time you will take to you know to set up your shop to get everything ready obviously during that time you are not you know you have no operations you have no business so how can you buy you know 30 percent local you will buy 30 percent local sourcing you will do only when your business starts so this is a much more realistic and pragmatic decision which will be which will produce results. The earlier condition was not uh, leading to anywhere. So. Uh, you have uh, come to a new chair now. My uh, question to you is, uh, there's a serious contraction in the rural economy. Uh, commodity prices are lower. I'm not saying it's the government's decisions which have led to it. There's uh, availability of uh, uh, capital in the rural areas is much lower. Capital formation is negative in the agricultural sector. Uh, of course, it's more the job of the agricultural ministry to probably look at it. But overall, how would the government actually handle a situation like this? Because there is rural distress, whatever we may say. There is significant rural distress and there is significant uh, dip in rural spending. I don't know if it is evident uh, otherwise, but uh, most consumer durable manufacturers claim so. No, I mean, we are aware about the rural, uh, you know, the um, uh, stress and the distress or whatever you call it. We are aware of that problem of, uh, you know, this year again, third consecutive year, we have had a very bad and uncertain monsoon. And uh, so naturally the farm incomes have been affected. Then you have the problem of rural indebtedness. There are issues relating to absence of uh, well-performing, well-working insurance you know, crop insurance scheme in our country. So these are issues of farm incomes, crop insurance, uh, rural uh, debt, uh, you know, rural indebtedness. All these issues are being uh, looked into by the government. And uh, to ensure that whatever is manufactured, of course, we have got whatever is produced. We have the MSP mechanism for rice and wheat and now pulses. And uh, so government is really taking upon itself a lot of responsibility to see that uh, 
you know this has to be ad uh, uh, you know the uh, problems of the sector are addressed this is one area where the government is fully engaged and uh, I would expect uh, some, you know, decisions to be taken in the coming months. But what you have mentioned is a very important point, and government is aware of certain challenges in this sector, and it is work in progress. Hello. Yeah, my name is Prabhakar and I am the President of the Madras Chamber of Commerce. First, let me thank you for having come here and then addressed us. For most of us, I think who are from the Chamber, it sounded like it just poured. The information flow that you gave us, the cogency and the points that you really told and then connected. See, it's the connecting the dots which is very important. And that gave us a real insight into where this economy is. And I can tell you that it is like what Chennai received in the last one week. It just poured. We just sank. <laughs> so congratulations to you on that. Second point, it's also a revelation that you spoke about the FDI. It is almost like 91. Thank you for having said that. It looked like that, but then when somebody in your place says that, then it actually impacts us. We understand what is the impact of that. Third point, you spoke about the real estate. And you mentioned about how real estate will really kickstart the economy and how it is interconnected with so many industries and the consumption. Now, but there is one difficulty which I would like you to take note of, which I'm sure the government has taken note of, that is with reference to environment clearance. Especially you spoke about the residential sector, and that is huge. But if the environment clearance is not going to be given, for example, it is unlike an industry. What is that building residential apartments got to do with an environmental clearance where it has to go through so many hurdles? It's in fact, in Chennai at least, about 20, 25 companies have been issued with notices of penalties varying from 5 crores to almost 30 crores and most of them have stopped work. And that is nothing to do with what, how they are going to pollute. Everything is being connected to the sewage system or it is being prepared there. But there is a difficulty with reference to environment clearance. Even if the foreign money is going to come, it is not going to kick start. I just want you to possibly comment on this environment clearance, whether something could be done both at the central level as well as at the state level. No, I have uh, made a note of your point. I mean, it's a, it is an impediment. We are aware of uh, this. As a part of... Uh, you know, this ease of doing business uh, exercise. The World Bank does a rating for India. Now, in association with the World Bank, there is a rating of states which is being done. Now, Maharashtra earlier used to, Bombay city, Mumbai city used to take a lot of time to give, uh, you know, uh, give uh, various permissions and clearances. But because of this thrust around, uh, you know, ease of doing business and the concern of Maharashtra government to increase their, improve their ranking, lot of process reforms have taken place. Now today there is a lot of competition among states. You do process reforms, you ease the process, you attract more money, you attract more investments. So I think it's a healthy competition which is going among the states and uh, that itself I think will spur most of the states to simplify their procedures. So far as the central government is concerned, I have made a note of your point, we are aware of this point and uh, we'll see what can be done. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Can you give it? Yes. I'm Lata, director of MAFWA. We are into HR services. So this is regarding the Skill India program. Basically, you're talking about it. I just want to know, like, uh, we all know that today it's very difficult to get people, uh, even um, youngsters, to get into the core areas, like whether it's plumbing, tooling, and all those kind of things. And without that, I think it's going to be very difficult to take this program. And uh, is there anything we're doing in terms of campaign to create the dignity of labor? I think, in my view, um, 
the last few years i can see the hospitality industry or also today the taxi drivers that way thanks to many of those cab companies which have come i think there is a lot more acceptance but in many industries in many areas i think this acceptance is not there even you go to a village today i go there and i ask a guy he says i want to work in an it industry okay so but then it's not possible so how do we really do that and is skill india doing anything to create that awareness and also that dignity of labor i think it's a very good uh, point you have made the um, uh, national skill development corporation was earlier uh, coming out with some advertisements and other things but you know these things cannot be done through newspaper advertisements i think it's a question of uh, our uh, mindset in western countries we see youngsters who are studying or who are doing research in part time they come and do all kinds of odd jobs in india you know we have this mindset problems and uh, uh, that reminds me of uh, what uh, you know the famous economist of his the greatest economist of its uh, of his times uh, john uh, this uh, keynes john keynes john menard keynes he said he said the difficulty is not in adopting new ideas the difficulty lies in giving up old ones <laughs> so that i think is the biggest challenge lot of i entirely agree lot of campaign will have to be done tamil nadu has a skill uh, development uh, i think they have a skill mission Should state be. skill uh, mission yeah, tamil nadu has department and the department, the department they department have is. many states have it but your point is well taken i think uh, this needs to be a kind of a campaign and uh, i will convey it to the right quarters at the appropriate time <laughs> to see that something is really done now what that appropriate quarters is i would not like to specify but i will convey it <laughs> thank thank you sir um, it's our pleasure i'm try to honor our chief guest uh, on behalf of the organizers the southern india chamber of commerce and industry and ji ramchandran memorial committee i request mr jawagar vadivelu uh, the immediate past president to come on to the dais please to honor mr shaktikant das please thank you sir uh, may now request uh, mr navneet ganpati the ceo of advanced sports to propose the formal vote of thanks at the outset i'd like to thank uh, shri shakti kantada sir for taking time out of his busy schedule and some of his thoughts were very very inspirational cerebral and i'm sure my grandfather would have really appreciated your speech sir thank you unfortunate that dr rao uncle who has always been the guiding force for our family was could not make it today due to a sudden personal commitment thanks venkatesan uncle for agreeing to be here at sh such short no uh, notice and give a wonderful tribute about my grandfather thank you sir uh, i'd be failing in my duty if i don't thank natrajan uncle for always blessing us last but not the least sikki for putting the entire lecture together My sincere thanks to all members of our family and friends to have come today and we're really honored. My parents and my cousin Krishna are glad that under the aegis of Sikki we are having this annually. Thank you all. May I now request everyone to rise for the national anthem. <laughs> 